whatever you want. <laughs> well, I like that we did a okay. We're ready. Okay. 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 Whew. We got this. This is we got this. Two girls, one ghost. Two girls, one ghost. We are your host ghostesses. Host hostesses, hostesses ghostesses. ghostesses. Whenever I think of hostesses, I think of the hostess treats. Oh. Yeah, I guess like those little I think I'm like trying to think of all of the different hostess treats. Is the hostess is it that brown one that has the like swirly white glaze on top or is hostess the brand? I think it's the brand. Yeah, it's the brand because there's a bunch of there's like ho hos, twinkies, yes, yes ding dongs. What a what dong. strange names. Ding dongs. I freaking <laughs> loved ding dongs. <laughs> so All good. of them. Well, we are your ding dongs. That's Corinne. Ding dong. Hi. I'm Sabrina. Hello. Hello. Just so everyone knows, I'm recording. I've been like a record on the road type of gal. So I'm like wherever You're I can nomad. find a spot. I'm a recording nomad. Yes. You are. You've got people to see, places to go. Babies, babies to, to snuggle, hold. kittens to make purr, so many things. Family to see. I guess babies is family. But um, so that being said, I am recording in my brother-in-law's office and there are a lot of men here and their voices may pick up. So it's probably here. not Sven. Just another it's not Sven is basically man. my FYI. Mm-hmm. Just another man. I also, because I can hear them all on their business calls, I'm so curious if they're going to hear us talking about ghosts and ghosts. what the heck they're going to say. <laughs> Honestly, that's going to make their day better because oh yeah, it's bringing so much newness to their office. I'm sure that they don't regularly um, talk ghosts over their water cooler. Or it's bringing a bunch of ghosts over here. Who knows? Yeah. Um. Speaking of not ghosts. But cats, you just triggered a memory I have that I had meant oh. – I've been meaning to tell you this for like a month or two once I learned. But you know how my okay. friend Allison, she lives in Marblehead, and I go up and I visit mm-hmm. her and we hang out in Marblehead. And she she's a cat person. They have three cats. They're cats. Spend a lot of time outdoors on leashes. They're, they're hanging out, having the best freaking life yeah, ever right on the it. beach. There's another cat that lives on their street in Marblehead. That doesn't belong to anyone, but belongs to the entire street, which I think is like so cute and so wonderful. I cannot for the life of me remember this cat's name, but apparently the cat showed up like 10 years ago and everyone just takes care of the cat. So the cat will go and basically I think get as many lunches and dinners as the cat wants and will go from house to house and just be like, cuddled and fed and given water and will go into all these people's homes like it's an open door policy with this cat but there's one particular family that the cat really likes to sleep with and so most of the nights this cat is with this one particular family on the street but if they go out of town the cat has like ranked his favorites for who to go to next like oh my main family at night isn't here so i'll just go knock on this person's door and so everyone just collectively has a cat on this one Stop. street in Marblehead, right by the ocean. And I was you know like, what? this is Sabrina's this... dream. To be that cat, for sure. But um, <laughs> also, this just proves that cats are so freaking smart. And mm-hmm. this cat is living the life and has manipulated in the best way and trained all of the humans on this street and is thriving. Like, he's the king of the court. And it's just a known thing. Like when Allison and and her boyfriend had moved in there, they were just basically introed to the cat and all the neighbors. The new were neighbor. Like, it's your cat now too. What's his name? I can't remember. Should I text her and ask her? Sure. And then maybe we'll find it. out halfway through the this yeah. episode. Let me ask. Stay tuned. Basically, that's our. You have to listen to the whole episode to find out where what the name of the cat is. Because I know you're <laughs> all so invested now. I was okay. So I feel like we've been doing so many collabs and crossovers that we might have some new listeners. And I just wanted to say welcome. Hello. Welcome. We apologize in advance because it is very likely that at some point during your listening experience, you will meet Sven or our resident ghost. Yes. Sven encompasses all spirits who come to visit our podcast. We like to think Sven is the nicest. 
Um, and then the dark things, we don't take credit for at all. We're so sorry. But there is a chance you may get haunted. We just recently had one of our most recent reviews was, I love this podcast so much, but things started happening and I'm so sad <laughs> that I cannot Aww. listen anymore. <laughs> Shoot. Honestly, though, that we get it and that makes sense. And sometimes people have to take breaks. But our expectation and our hope is that you come back. But we understand if you need to take like a three, five month break because activity is picking up. Unfortunately for us, well, fortunately and unfortunately, um, we don't take breaks, but we pivot topics when things get a little too active. That's when we start to incorporate some of the like fluffier, kinder, warmer stories. That's when you start to incorporate the the fluffier, warmer stories. Yes. Not me. Yes. That's when I when I say I'm 50% of two girls, one ghost, and I will not continue with the darkness for the next two weeks. So I need Technically, a freaking break. We're, we're each 33%. Sven. Sven is, because although Sven is not listed on our business title, yeah. so maybe that's where some of the hauntings come from. Just like a little bit of like, oh, hey, what about me? I'm literally in the title. Because last October was definitely our one of our scarier haunted experiences. And then when I talked about La Llorona, that one freaked me out a bunch because suddenly all the pipes in my apartment started making all these noises and I would like hear the dripping faucets and it happened for like two or three days. And then you had one, which I don't even know. Do you remember what the topic was that you started to research and then you had to stop? It was past lives. Yes. We we brought this up with, what can I say? Who we did a crossover with or should I wait? Sure. It's coming out. Okay. When (laughs) we just recorded with National Park After Dark, Danielle and Cassie, which we're super excited for everyone to hear that one. It comes out August 1st, I believe. Yeah. Um, Yeah. We recorded very early because they've got a lot going on. Summer is happening. all over the place. Yeah. They have so many cool trips that they're going on. So August. Yes. You'll hear that. But I had forgotten about this until we recorded with them because we were talking about, I can't remember how it came up, but early days. This is maybe one the, our first year of the podcast. We did an episode about past lives, and I had researched. I was ready to go. We set up to record, and I just like in the hour leading up to recording, I got bad vibes. Like I just had not even bad vibes, but more of like I felt like you know when you have when you're super empathetic and you just take on the feelings and emotions of people around you. I felt that. And it was a heaviness and it was a sadness. And my gut was just like, I think it's related to this story. I don't know. So you were researching it. one particular past life story. It wasn't just like a compilation. Mm-hmm. It was one person. One person. Yeah. And so I had to say, hey, Corinne, I know we were about to record, but uh, can uh, we do it tomorrow? Because I need to re-research what yeah. I picked. I am so curious to what caused that for you. Like, was it, I don't know, this person's soul or like something that chipped off of them that was ready to hear you talk about this sort of thing? Or was there something else kind of like lurking and lingering? I don't know. Well, because I don't know what the story was about. I don't know who you were covering. I forget, to be honest. I think it was a woman, but... Yeah, I don't I don't know. I don't remember and it, yeah, it could be very possible. I lived in a complex with a lot of people. Like I could have been picking up on something else. Who knows? I really I really don't. Um but I think it was early enough in our It really does rattle you though when you have that sort of it's almost like an intrusive feeling instead of an intrusive thought like when you absorb somebody else's emotions and it's really uncomfortable and it's really hard to shake. It always makes me feel ill when it happens yeah. to me. Yeah. Yeah. And then you don't know how to deal with it because it's not yours. Right. You're like, I can't. Yeah. What do you even do? Like, there's nothing to work through. There's no one to call to say, (laughs) I'm sorry, we broke up. I just know that someone broke up. Like, Uh, yeah. Or something. I don't know. know, Maybe just take a shower and give it to the water because that's supposed to be the water. Maybe give it to the water. Anyway, this is all to say. Um, we apologize if you're new and you do get haunted, but we hope you keep coming back. And we, we've had YouTube for now a year and I feel like we haven't done a ton of marketing or like promoting it. So, Hey, if you want to see what we're wearing, cause I'm wearing my overalls and you know how I love overalls. Um, 
you can go check us out on YouTube and watch all of our episodes. We've been doing it for a year, so you can see our faces. You can see us react to things. Um, you can see our eyes dart back and forth as we read things off of our computer. I don't know. It's fun. Take a sip of tea every time I touch my face, which is you're going to have a gallon of tea by the end. So <laughs> if anyone's struggling with drinking enough water, that's a fun game. I'm also curious if people see anything behind us while we're recording. Uh, well, the fires in Canada are roaring. So if anyone sees anything outside of our windows at this moment, unfortunately, I think it's going to be smoke because it is coming down the East Coast and it is bad to be outside. It's like so it's yellow and hazy and smoky outside. I can only imagine what it's like for all those poor people who are experiencing it like in their own homes because yesterday when I walked outside, my lungs, I mean, I didn't realize that there were fires even going on at the time. And I texted Brian who was at work and I was like, my lungs feel like hot and the outside smells like burning wood chips and there's a haze what's going on because part of me was like holy shit is boston on fire and that's how bad it is it feels like there's that's a how fire bad. right right here. here yep and there's not that's yeah it reminds me of a couple of years ago when there were those fires up north in california and they were coming down it was so bad um <sighs> awful but well here we are I'm so excited. This is a two-parter. Mm-hmm. And I've been I've been holding this one in my back seat for a while. I feel like I love doing two-parters and this one could have been like a 18-parter because yeah. really what I'm doing is I'm focusing on some hauntings in Boston. And Boston is Yay! old and it is haunted and there are so many spots, there are places that I have lived, there are places that I frequent and there's just skeletons in our back doors every <laughs> Everywhere. Literally here. Yes. In your backyard, the under the backyard, ground. Backyard, probably in the, everywhere. In the frames of some houses, I'm sure there's people, <laughs> people stashed away in, in the, the old cellars. brick walls. Yes. No, yeah. seriously. It's I mean, so you've got, you've freaking haunted. You've got history. You've got the mob, like Whitey Bulger and all of that going on. There's just, it's beyond just being one of the, like the earliest settled places. And then also going dating back it's to native tribes. Yeah. Historic. Yeah. There's so much so here. Much. And I feel like also we started the podcast when I moved back to Boston. And I feel like those two things happening at the same time simultaneously reignited or not even reignited, ignited because it had never been an interest in the past, my love of history. And so now I love history and I get to see it everywhere when I walk around and we get to research places every single week on this podcast. And so I just feel like a huge place in my heart for Boston. And so on this episode, I'm going to focus on uh, one particular area, and then we'll move very close to that area in the next episode. Oh, okay. So if you've ever been to Boston, Massachusetts, chances are you've walked through America's oldest city park, which is Boston Common which Sabrina, you have walked through many times, so you know exactly where I'm going to be talking about. You know what makes me really happy about this episode is I visited you in Boston a couple times now, and every time I have you take me on like the same little haunted tour and we go through like the same spots because so you, know you are the of, best. Actually, you're going to know all of these spots that I'm going to talk about too. But I never get sick of it. And I'm so excited that everyone else gets to experience it. Just close your eyes. Imagine Corinne holding your hand and excitedly showing you all these spots, eyes wide. Can't wait to tell you about deaths and hauntings and burials because it's a it's the best thing you can ever do. Sabrina, I have a new business idea for us. And this one I suddenly oh. feel extremely passionate about. And I'm going to be pissed if anyone copies us before we're able to what is make it? this happen. I think that we should create some sort of virtual AI creation of ourselves where <gasps> we people can use their like cell phones or whatever. And when they're going through different places, haunted places, different cities, different towns, we pop up as like a person and it's like, here's what's happening here. And then we walk and like they follow us. Like we're our own little avatar that's pre-programmed to bring people on haunted tours. And everyone can I already do have it. a voice. 
I ready? I have I hear it. Hey, follow me. I'm gonna show you this haunted place. <laughs> Let's go. Like, just doing like the the classic, like <laughs> actually that would be because I assume if we get to do it, that it would be our actual bodies, but I like the idea that we would pretend to be even faker versions of us that like do the whole <gasps> We should classic, be ghosts. Like, we should be ghosts. Well, we don't have legs. We have like the ghost tail. Wait, Sabrina, this is so good. Ugh, I'm already mad at the world that I don't just know how to do this right now. This is okay. Excellent. Well, this this reminds me of my other idea that we had when we were walking through Austin when we were there together. I was like, there are so many drawings and pictures of what these towns looked like back in the day that I think it would be so cool to have a virtual reality, a VR experience where you can walk through what the towns looked like in different time periods because, you know, dirt roads, there's horse and buggies going by or the old timey early cars. Right. And you can just set it to like 1810 and see what happens yeah. and then fast forward 30 years and it's like a completely different city. Ugh, it really would be. But like combining all those together, it would be so awesome if like instead of just sitting in your own – I mean, I guess it, there's the benefit of doing this too from like your own couch and being able to walk through this like virtual reality. If you had some way to do it while you're actually there, which kind of reminds me of all the Apple updates that are coming, which are really freaky. The yes. Apple glass. Yes. If you haven't seen this, you guys, it is Black Mirror. It is scary how. <laughs> it's so scary. Like we are, we are years away from having chips in our brain and we can just like have like with our eyes or our hands click on things it is so scary it is happening now it made me really panicky when I was watching all of that because I was like this is simultaneously so cool that we're able to like dream up these things and potentially make them a reality but why do them like what how does that I mean Re the reality is, is hundreds of years ago, people probably had the same questions and fear about different things that were happening that we experience today as normal life. But it's so hard for me to picture how that affects us and what we'll be like in the future. And that's what scares me. It's going to be like um, Wally, -E, where we're all like sitting in like wheelchairs and just like drinking sodas and pressing yeah. buttons and don't have to move Ugh. to go anywhere yes. but it is really cool it's, it's crazy if people want to see it um they mm -hmm. can also this is a good crowdsourcing crime you can continue in a minute but like we don't have any abilities to tech like with tech or engineering to create any of this if you're listening and you're like oh i do this at breakfast it's easy peasy um okay email us then yeah, Don't email keep us. your Please. secret skills to yourself. No. Or to I'm your barely... company that you're working for. <laughs> yeah, give us all of your trade secrets. <laughs> Abandon any uh, contracts you have with your employer and come help us. We can't us. pay you yet, but you can be. No. But it will be spectacular when it actually is yes. built and we'll all be rich in experience and history, which is what I'm going to attempt to do for all of you now is enrich you okay. in the history of Boston. You ready to enrich us every day by being in our lives and in our ears. Oh, thank you so much. All right, I'll shut okay. up now. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> no, Sabrina, how about you present the... I like hearing your voice way more than hearing mine, so I would be happy to just sit back and drink my tea today. No, no, but it's your turn. I did this last week. Okay, fine. And I'm doing it next week too because it's a two-parter. You chose it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't complain. I'm not complaining. Boston Common, if you've been to Boston, there is a big, big park basically in the center of Boston. It kind of divides like Beacon Hill, the theater district, downtown. If you're coming from the north end, you'll probably likely find yourself there. Back Bay. It kind of sits all right in the middle. The public garden is right next to it. And so if you've ever been to Boston for more than 12 hours, the chances of you walking through this are pretty high because Boston's not a big city. And it's also 50 acres. So you really do, whether you're going to see the things that are at Boston Common uh, or just cutting through it to get to other places in Boston, the chances of many of you who are listening having stepped foot here, I think is pretty high, which is why I really wanted yes. to do this. So 
When you're walking through Boston Common, visitors wander through the winding trails. They follow the red brick road of the Freedom Trail, which cuts through there. And you can also admire some of the beautiful things. There's a carousel for kids to play on. There's lemonade stands. There's amazing views from Frog Pond, which little kids play in in the summer. And in the winter, they turn it into an ice skating rink, which is super fun. So cool. So cool. There's many monuments. There's just different places where people post up to just hang out, picnic beneath the shady trees, play frisbee by the slope of the hill, let their dogs off leash to frolic around with other city pooches. And there's also a lot of, I guess, like rallies and political speeches and things that happen here too. So it's a it's a big place for people to gather, whether for leisure or to be a tourist or for uh, other various reasons. But as people are wandering through here, what most people don't realize is that they're walking above dead bodies, potentially thousands cool, of cool. them. Cool, 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 cool. cool. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's back up. History lessons now. In the early 1600s, Boston Common was a farm owned by William Blackston, also spelled Blackstone in some accounts, but I'm going to call him Blackston. He was the first European settler in Boston. William Blackston had arrived to Weymouth, Massachusetts in 1623, and he moved from Weymouth up north a few miles to what we now know to be Boston. And at the time, Boston was mostly mud flats. It was super swampy. It was like a little peninsula. There were some natural springs, rock bulges. It was just like super, super beautiful. And William was struck by its beauty and and by all of the land. And let's remember that there were a lot of native people who lived here first. And so he was the one white guy and he was like, this is great. And (laughs) he lived there for five years before writing to Isaac Johnson about how perfect this would be for a settlement. And Isaac is listening and he's like, oh, I do think that this sounds like a great idea. So he brings a group up to the area and they settle in what we now know to be Charlestown, which Sabrina, you've also been to Charlestown. Where was Isaac before this? They're all in, oh, so, well, they all came from England, but I'm pretty sure they were all chilling kind of more within the like Weymouth, Massachusetts to Rhode Island section. Okay. Okay. And so people were starting to like migrate up north eventually getting right. to like Maine and all of those areas. Because take more land was their motto. Yes, it was. <laughs> Super unfortunate. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what else to say. It sucks. <laughs> uh, we, we're all aware here of how yeah. um, we know. horrendous some of the early – or all of the early settlements were and that it was not necessarily a – We're friendly. It was more of like, get out. We want this now. Yes. Greed. Yeah. And so, I mean, whether William Blackston told Isaac about this area of Boston or not, it would have happened because that's just what was happening. Everyone was Mm -hmm. migrating north, south, west, and just kind of taking over, colonizing America. So before Isaac died in 1630, His dying wish was for the settlement that was across the river, because he settled in Charlestown, but across the river, the area where Blackston lived, he really wanted it to be named Boston after his hometown in England. That's nice that it wasn't, like, named after him. No, no. It was just – it was a – it was named very lovingly after a place that he loved and cared about, and he saw how beautiful it was here and felt a connection to it, and so he named it Boston because it reminded – him of just like all of the the good things and loving things in his life, I guess. But within this deal, I guess, w- when Isaac's dying breath essentially was to name this place Boston, William Blackston, who was the one who told Isaac to come here, he was like, oh, okay, well, I feel like there's going to be more attention coming here now and there's more people moving here. So I would like to negotiate a deal here and be granted 50 acres of this newly named Boston to keep for myself because I've been living here for a long time and I don't want to lose all my land and all the beauty and all the vastness of this space. At the time, 50 acres was 10% of that whole entire area. So it was a large, large amount because Boston, remember, was just a little bit of a peninsula. So now I'm going to give a little bit more of a history lesson We've turned into a history and horror and haunts podcast. 
We have. And I love it. I guess we've always been that way, but I think it's been more, we've really, really become history buffs. And I feel like history buffs might be like, you guys aren't history buffs, so don't come at me. But we feel like we are. If I told my younger self that I would be this interested in history as an adult, she'd be like, huh, you dummy. No, you won't. No, she wouldn't have said that. She'd be like, okay. She didn't say anything. Okay. So now Sabrina's looking at an image and we're going to put it on display here in YouTube. So if you're looking at this image, which is kind of like in a sepia tone, this is what Boston used to look like. It was this tiny, tiny little peninsula. And Charlestown is kind of like that uh, tortilla-shaped <laughs> mound of land right across the way. So that's kind of where the settlement was. And then Blackston lived in what is Boston, where you can see like how the settlement had sort of built up. But for the most part, it was almost like an island. Like it was barely a peninsula. There was barely land connecting this thing. So it was quite small. And then the next photo that we're going to display is what William Blackston's house looked like. So he had this quaint little cottage along all of the marshes and the ocean and all of these trees and just everything that was here. And it was so beautiful. Over the years, the next photo, the one that's in green and blue, is what Boston looks like now. So the dark green is what the shoreline looked like in 1630. So this is when Blackston was there, when Boston was becoming Boston. And then the light green, it's, it's from 1995, but it's essentially exactly what it looks like today. One sixth of Boston today is landfill. They added it in. The majority of Whoa. Boston was not here originally. It's massive. Freaky, right? That's so much. It's so much. Yeah. So basically over the past few centuries, people would fill in all of the marshes and the tidal flats because they wanted more land to build on. And they built all the land pretty much on sea level too. So essentially this is what – this is like the thing that eats up so much time in my brain is – I don't understand what Boston's plan is for 50 years from now because it's going to be underwater and they keep building new buildings. And I'm like, is everyone who lives on like the first and second story who has an ocean view just going to be looking at a cement wall? Because I have no idea how they're, they can't just like lift the entire city. Maybe they can, but I don't know how to do that. That's, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It is really impressive either. though that they were able to, add that much land yeah, yeah it's fascinating it's fascinating to me that like instead of expanding that way they expanded into the water right yeah and the other thing too is like the the topography of boston is so different now too because when when you wander around boston if you go to beacon hill and the north end which are two and i guess boston common which is what we're talking about all of those places existed originally and the north end in beacon hill had hills you know they had like little mountains and originally this area was i'm going to butcher it but it was like some sort of like french or so pronunciation of basically like three mountains because there were three mountains here but they have over time either completely demolished mountains or sliced so much of the hills away to create a much more like livable and buildable flat land isn't it wild what we are able to do to our terrain? Yeah, it is crazy. Also, these photos are giving me flashbacks to middle school, high school, and college where you would do the map. They would give you a map and then you had to – It was they would give it to you blank and you had to write like the rivers and the mm -hmm. countries and yeah. like, oh, I was – terrible, worst nightmare. Really? Oh, that, I was so good at it. <laughs> forget so history, it. forget math, but memorizing where things were, I was all over that globe. Wow. Okay, but for Impressive. people who live in Boston or have been to Boston, if you live in Back Bay or Seaport, those things, you're on, fully on top of landfill. That did not exist. Basically, in a morbid way, you're going underwater. You're going underwater. And back then, 10% wasn't – now knowing how much bigger Boston is, despite it still being a very small city, 10% wasn't a ton of land, but it was still 
a lot for what the space was. So Blackstone had negotiated this deal, got 10% of the land, around 50 or so acres. And unfortunately for Blackstone, just three years later, the 4,000 Puritan citizens who now took up shop in Boston said, ooh, we don't think it's very cool for anyone to own that much land. So let's make the ownership of that much land untenable. Let's make your life miserable. Let's peer pressure the crap out of you until you give us your land. So basically, the Anglican pastor Blackston, who did not vibe with the Puritans, he was bullied into selling back 44 of his 50 acres to the Puritans for what would be in today's money, $5,500. That's it? Yeah. <laughs> it was like nothing. Upsetting. Oh, poor guy. I was expecting it to be like $3 million. Yeah. No. No, Hmm. he lost a lot of land for barely anything. The land quickly was turned into the town commons. So it was a place for the 4,000 plus residents to gather together. It was a place for them to also let their cattle graze for the next two centuries. So basically people would have a bunch of cattle. They'd just like let them freely go and graze. Eventually there were restrictions on the cattle um, that I was reading about because a lot of the richer people would come in and they'd have like 70 cattle that they'd let loose. And the amount of space that were on the common like could not sustain that many cattle eating and so there were limits on how many cattle could be in there eventually but it was just a a, an important place for everyone to kind of gather together and also important to know is the colony grew over decades and because they're growing and because their infrastructure isn't what it is today the Charles Street side of Boston Common, which is where I basically lived right there in in uh, Beacon Hill up on the hill, that side of Boston Common was the unofficial dumping ground because it was the lowest, flattest part of the area. And so people would just basically put all of the like gross, rotting food and items and all of their own feces over there. And it was, quote... A moist stew that reeked <laughs> and that was a mess to walk over. A moist stew. Yeah, gross. So gross. And apparently it became Ew. Or, or it remained a kind of a moist, gross stew until 1895. Yuck. No. <laughs> anyway. Wow. Okay. Blackston was pissed. He did not get along with these people, and he was like, whatever, fine, I'm out. Gave away his 44 acres of the 50 acres, and then he moved himself 35 miles south and became the first European settler, again, the first white man, he's really paving the way, uh, heading to this one particular area of Rhode Island. So he was just roaming around there. He was hoping to just quietly settle on some land. Um he also, so it was said, which we know history is rewritten, so I don't know how much truth there is to this, but apparently he was very good friends and very friendly with the native groups there and the individuals in that area. So he was the one person that kind of moved in, but they all lived really peacefully together. Um, I don't know if that's true. Yeah, yeah. You hope it's true. I hope it's true too. His life sounded pretty sweet. He would just tend to his cattle. He would garden. He even cultivated the first variety of American apple, which is called the yellow sweeting. And he had the largest library of the colonists at the time. So he just like- He was a scholar. He was a scholar. He just like lived peacefully in his little cabin in Rhode Island. Uh, But then his property was burned down during the King Philip's War. So it doesn't exist anymore. But King Philip's War, perfect segue back to Boston Common. We have talked about the King Philip's War a few times, but the very extremely, extremely quick version of events is that essentially Native tribes and colonists had a sort of deal in place, and the colonists kept violating the alliance that they had with the Native people. So tensions rose, and soon there was a full-on war between the colonists and the Native tribes in New England. It lasted just under three years. It is the deadliest war in colonial American history, killing about 30% of the colonists, wiping out many of the native tribes, killing hundreds of them, and enslaving a majority of others. So it was absolutely devastating. 
Boston saw some bloodshed. Just like and a lot of New England. Barbaric. Yeah. Didn't they put the native tribe, the leader, his head on a stake? On a stick. Yes. They did. They what did. was his name? So I can. I'm going to butcher all of this history, but I'm pretty sure it was like his dad was oh, the one that was like kind Philip. of. It mean King Philip. Oh, King Philip. Yes. King Philip. Yeah. King Philip's war. Because his dad was maintaining tent maintaining the tensions kind of was like trying to appease everybody and then when his dad passed and king philip came into into power wasn't he the one that was like i'm butchering this but i think he was the one that was like no we're not taking this bullshit which and is stood fair. up like for them yeah yeah they were just being walked all over and i also can't remember why because his name isn't philip but it became philip and i can't remember the reason why let's see Metacomet, yeah, that was his name. Metacomet. Yeah, so it was just his a English name. So it was a name given to him by the settlers. Okay, there we go. See, it just wasn't, was obviously a very, very bloody event. And it stretched far outside of Boston. It was in Rhode Island. It was in Maine. It was in Connecticut. It was all over New England. There's a map you can look at too online to see kind of like all of the native tribes and everyone who was affected all of the land and it's expansive. So Boston was one of the places that there were tensions and that war took place during this time. Tantamouse was a very well-known Native American Nipmuc leader and he was also a spiritual healer and during the war colonists forced him and his family to Deer Island where he had previously given this rebellious speech that was obviously against the colonists, right? And so the colonists were like, you were mean to us. And so they grabbed all of his family and him and they marched him to Deer Island, which I can literally see. I I could, I wish I could just like easily turn my computer and like zoom in on the screen so everyone could (laughs) see it, but I'm staring at Deer Island right now. And they brought him there. They whipped and tortured him, but he escaped, which was a very exciting turn of events. He had a chance. But unfortunately, his son was promised by the colonists that his father and his family would be safe if they just gave up his father's hiding place, which the son did because he trusted them. And Lord knows what other horrible things they did to get this information out of this poor boy. When the colonists found Tantamouse, they placed, this is graphic, they placed a noose around his neck. They marched him publicly down the street, all the way to Boston Common, to a large tree, which is over a century old, called the Great Elm. And it was said that this elm had been planted a century before for prosperity, which is very ironic given the role that this tree is about to play for us in this story over the next two centuries. Does this tree still stand? No, it does not. Okay, good. Good. Here he was hung and left for others to see. His family was then taken and sold into slavery. And during this time in colonial era, public executions were a sort of sick entertainment for people. And large, large crowds would gather to watch other people being murdered. So Tantamouse and 44 other Native Americans were publicly executed by hanging on the Great Elm during this war. And it can be assumed that each execution drew a crowd. I'm really curious because, uh, you know, I think for a really long time in history, hangings were like a public thing that people came to. And yeah, it seemed like it was a source of entertainment in a way. But I do I mean, think about like the Colosseum and like ancient Rome yeah. too. I do wonder though if there were people who were just like, this is horrendous. Why are we doing this? And if there was this expectation that you had to go yeah and if you weren't there there was something wrong with you i know that is an interesting thought because it's like is it human nature to be fascinated with those things is it conditioned are we repulsed but is there something that pulls us even closer to the event because of the repulsion like what did those people experience how many people were ill watching that and refused to go versus the people who were like let's go have tea in the park and watch four men be hung. Yeah. I don't know. It's so hard to know because my mind, and again, like this is probably societal and because I was raised learning how horrific this is, that I'm like, absolutely not. I could never imagine myself 
if that were publicly a thing that still happened, I could never imagine doing that. And imagine how different it would be if you were young, though, and witnessed all those things. And you were four years old and it was a normal part of your upbringing. Right. But then at the same time, think about our society and our fascination with true crime and murder and like the amount of documentaries. And Mm -hmm. I guess maybe we're not like fully witnessing someone be killed, but we're still fascinated by it. It's the morbid curiosity. It exists within us. Okay. So at the time, a large majority of the population in Boston were Puritans. Now the Puritans themselves were a reformed religious group that we've talked about before. They previously belonged to the Church of England and they basically were like, ugh, this church that we belong to, it feels too similar to Roman Catholicism. We think we should eliminate the ceremonies. We should eliminate any practices that aren't rooted in the Bible. We should have a lot more like strict rules and and live a very, very specific way. And so really the Puritans, a lot of them, that was like a motivating force for them to come and colonize. Basically, I was reading somewhere, someone said like, The thing people aren't talking about is that America was founded by a group of, like, religious fanatics. Yeah. (laughs) And it's true. It's true. I mean, I guess kind of everywhere was, like, religion has played such a controversial role in history. And there was also such a desire to be, like, I mean, this is why the Revolutionary War occurred, right? Like it was like, a, oh, well, I'm doing all of this. And so I want to have a unique take and I want to be different from where I came from. And that causes tensions. I'm pretty sure like the English accent or American accent came because they wanted to sound different than where they came from. I've heard that too. So they gave themselves like a new twang basically to, yeah. <laughs> to be different. Yeah. I, someone else can fact check that, but... They were all in their Madonna era. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what if I just start talking in a weird way, like, just to... It's hard to not adopt other people's accents. Like, do you find that? Like, when you're around someone with, oh, like, a southern 100%. drawl or... Yeah, I find myself very quickly starting to imitate them. It's hard to get yourself yeah. out of it. I'm like, it's what so even hard. is my accent? Like, what is my voice? Beside, aside from a reflection of everyone around me. I don't know. I'm a, I'm a parrot. <laughs> okay, so the Puritans themselves, they were these reformed religious members, previously part of the Church of England. They ha- came, with Amer- came to America with all of these ideas of how to live. And so they themselves once evolved from their roots and, and were mm-hmm. trying to make a name for themselves. And yes, they could not, and yet they could not be less accepting of other offshoots of Protestantism, uh, specifically those who followed the Religious Society of Friends, those that we call Quakers. So some differences here between Puritans and Quakers. Puritans thought that certain people were chosen by God for salvation and that humans are hopelessly sinful. Quakers believed God is inside everyone and you could talk directly to God and Jesus if you wanted to. Everybody had an inner light. So basically the Puritans were like, no, there's specific people who who can preach the word and, and are prophetic. And Quakers were like, no, I think all of us can pray and, and speak directly to our source and our savior. Puritans had very rigid rules and laws about who they were, uh, what you could practice, what you could believe, which included strict gender roles. Whereas Quakers had religious freedom, they promoted the separation of church and state, they believed in equality, they supported everyone, especially the Native Americans, and women could also be preachers. So they could not be more different, (laughs) though offshoots basically of the same religion. Right. The Puritans thought the Quakers' way of life was absolute blasphemy. They were a danger to society. So what did they do? They enacted several laws against Quakers, and then they tortured and killed them. Massachusetts was the most active state in New England to do so. Quakers were put in stock and pillory. So I'm going to display a photo, and Sabrina, you have a photo right now too. So stock and pillory are the two devices that are 
these wooden contraptions where people were basically locked in. Either their feet were locked into place so they, they couldn't move or it's like the thing that I think we see most often where your hands and your head are through this wooden plank and you're trapped in place. Yeah. I don't understand why the one photo of the man is like pensive he's, thinking. He's he's in timeout. He's contemplating his choices. Is he contemplating his... Why are we so horrendous as a species? Like what? I don't know. And it's so bizarre too, these depictions of people like that. The one, the photo that you're referencing, it's like this guy who has all of the buttons perfectly done on his pants and his jacket and he's wearing his wig and he has his shiny little loafers on and he's like trying to present to society as this person maybe who has it together and yet he's about to be brutally tortured by fellow human beings it's it's hard to wrap my mind around us being able to do all of that at once that it, these things aren't mutually exclusive but so the puritans they would grab these quakers and they'd be like you think different than me nah and they would whip them with these three corded and knotted whips. They would fine the Quakers, imprison the Quakers, mutilate them, banish them, kill them. A few examples of this, and these are not good. So if you don't want to hear them, skip forward a few minutes. But just north of Boston, there were three Quaker women who were preaching in the seacoast of New Hampshire. They were arrested by the Puritans and they were sentenced to walk naked down to the waist, which was a common thing for them to do to women, was to basically like strip them so that their chest, their breasts were exposed to embarrass them. Like Game of Thrones. Yeah. And they would make them walk the 80 miles in the middle of winter from the seacoast of Barefoot, Hampshire. right? Uh, I don't know if these specific women were, but right. I know that they were stripped. They were tied to the back of a cart. They were whipped publicly. And basically they would, every time they passed through a town, they would cause a lot of commotion, the the Puritans would, so that people would come out and get to witness the embarrassment of these Quakers, these women. I'm just picturing that scene in Game of Thrones. They're like, shame, shame. And like people are throwing vegetables. I'm sure like, it was very similar. They're moist stew at. Oh, they're moist like, stew. Just, that's what I'm going to say now. Sorry, I got to go deal with some moist stew. Yeah. I like when you come out of the bathroom, you're like, ooh, instead of saying like, give it a beat, you're like, there's some moist stew in there. You might want to, <laughs> I want to wait. <laughs> you Gross. might get some very confused looks. Yeah. People are running in like, what? There's stew? No. <laughs> Different kind of stew, my friend. No. Gardy Lou. Gardy Lou. <laughs> Eventually, these women were rescued by a Quaker who was living in Maine over in Kittery, which is where my fake ID was from when I was underage. Um, and <laughs> protected. Similar to the, to these women, Herodias Gardiner was a Quaker woman who was stripped down to the waist and made to walk 60 miles home to Weymouth, Massachusetts. She had an infant at the time, and she walked the entire way, at least from what I could see in the reports, walked the entire way holding her infant and continuing to like feed and breastfeed her infant when her child needed to, all while being tortured and publicly humiliated for 60 miles. I just give me chills. But some people were never rescued and some people never made it home. Enter Mary Dyer. Mary had lived in Boston and had a traumatic event happen to her. She gave birth to a stillborn child that had many defects. And so this child was stillborn. And if it hadn't been, it probably wouldn't have lived very long either based on what I was seeing written about this child. And so it was really, really devastating to her. It was absolutely heartbreaking to her and her husband. And so she had to bury this child in secrecy because there was a lot going on at the time. And basically having given birth to this child in the way that she did and and with the defects that this child had, it would have been basically bad news for her. People would have viewed her as doing something wrong. You know, like we're coming up on witch trial era. Witch trials, right. Yeah. Right. So she buried this child in secrecy. However, the society that she lived in in Boston found out and she was viewed as a monster. After a decade of hardship and of being a societal outcast, she was tried and banished for her crimes, which was basically having a 
stillborn child stillborn which she had no control over no no can you imagine i can't, I can't. this How reminds awful. me of the witch just, just series of events yeah yes yeah you're right because that's also very religious based it was yeah i think the family's the kicked out for not having the same religious mm-hmm. views totally yeah. and it's set in the same exact era as what happened right here with mary dyer mm-hmm. uh so she was banished from massachusetts for both having a stillborn and for her beliefs because she was not fully bought into the Puritan beliefs. So she originally headed to Rhode Island where she lived for a little bit. And then she boarded a ship and she headed to England. She stayed back in England for five years. And it was here that she was hard introed and converted to Quakerism. She received the what gift What does that of mean? Ministry. Hard introed. Sorry, I just meant like she was introduced to quakerism like got like a crash course i think i'm using like gen z slang i spent too much time on tiktok is that like a hard a hard intro yeah (laughs) i've heard it a lot but maybe it is gen z i don't know yeah basically it's like getting a crash course like you're fully exposed to something very quickly okay this episode for so many reasons is just making me contemplate life in a pretty morbid way and i'm really glad i have therapy after this so i'm so sorry it's It's not your fault it's more of just it's just more humanity i'm just like yeah yeah i love how we came into this episode with so much enthusiasm like yeah boston so much history it's so rich in stories and fascinating and i'm like this is super depressing and very sad. But you'll get to ghost stories and all of that. Oh, I which will. Is, yeah, probably still depressing, but more exciting in a way. Right. And also, let's remember, this isn't just a full-on Boston episode. I am focusing on Boston Common specifically and the stories that are tied to that. And so unfortunately, there's a lot of sadness that happened specifically at Boston Common. So Mary Dyer, she's a Quaker now. It was said that she was given the gift of ministry um, and she returns to Boston. When she returned to Boston, she was immediately imprisoned and banished for being a Quaker. Quite the homecoming for her. Why'd, she, every come, time, why'd she come back? That's my question. She she had a very determined spirit where I think she was like, no one can tell me what to do. She was, she was the people – she was a protester, right? Like she's the person picketing in front of the White House of her time basically saying like we deserve religious freedom you can't control where i live and and what i believe in just because you disagree with me so that's yeah she she took on that role and she was confident and comfortable being in that role um and so she did go back to boston and every time she was released from jail she would be banished she would return and then she'd be imprisoned again and eventually the puritans are like okay we know a way to banish you, Mary Dyer, for good, and that is to kill you. So Mary and three other male Quakers were to be executed together. On October 27th, 1659, Mary walked hand in hand with two of the convicted men of the three on either side of her. And her closeness, the fact that she was in between them, she was holding their hands and and right between them, made people very uncomfortable with the physical touch that she had with these guys. And they very quickly moved to execute her and the three others. It actually took place on the Boston Neck. So this wasn't in Boston Common, but it was right next to it. And they hung the two men first. And then when it was Mary's turn to step out, her arms and legs were bound. Her face was covered by a handkerchief. And she, just as she was about to have the board taken out from under her, she was suddenly excused. A petition from her son had come through and authorities needed to review their actions. So basically what I read was that essentially they were insinuating that the authorities needed to talk about what the next and like proper move forward would be because the two men who had just died were were dying as martyrs like there was already a stir and some gossip and these two men were now martyrs and so to ensure that people didn't get too riled up and too rebellious they should let mary go to soften the martyrdom of the two men before to like lessen 
what they had just given their lives for. Okay. Well, good for Mary. No, Mary's pissed. Or maybe not. Mary's super oh. unhappy about that. She's like – Oh, she wanted – If I can't live the way that I want to freely in my community, I'm going to die a martyr and no one can stop me. And uh, her poor son is like trying to find a way to save his mom. <laughs> She's ma- she's mad though. She's like, I could have died a martyr, and these people are never going to change. And so the next day, she writes to the general court, and tells them, this quote, "My life is not accepted, nor availeth me, in comparison with the lives and liberty of the truth and servants of the living God, for which in the bowels of love and meekness I sought you. Yet nevertheless, with wicked hands have you put two of them to death, which makes me to feel that the mercies of the wicked is cruelty." I rather choose to die than to live as from you as guilty of their innocent blood. So she's, she's sharp with her words and she leaves after that to Rhode Island. She spends a year down in Rhode Island with her life. And then she returns to Boston with a plan. She would either change the laws or she would hang as a woman and as a martyr. Yeah, Mary. Ten days after she returns to Boston, she was brought to Governor Endicott. The report of the exchange is as follows. Endicott says, are you the same Mary Dyer that was here before? Mary says, I am the same Mary Dyer that was here the last general court. Endicott says, you will own yourself a Quaker, will you not? And she says, I own myself to be reproachfully so-called. Endicott says, sentence was passed upon you the last general court and now likewise you must return to the prison and there you remain till tomorrow at nine o'clock then thence you must go to the gallows and there you will be hanged till you are dead and dyer says mary dyer says this is no more than what thou said saidst before so she's like you always say this shit yeah what what are you even trying to say nothing's changed and endicott's like but now it is to be executed. Therefore, prepare yourself tomorrow at nine o'clock. And Mary says, I came in obedience to the will of God, the last general court, desiring you to repeal your unrighteous laws of banishment on pain of death. And that same is my work now. An earnest request, although I told you that if you refuse to repeal them, the Lord would send others of his servants to witness against them so she's basically she's like you're the evil dickhead and every you believe in god he's watching you wow and it is said that then he asked mary dyer if she was a prophetess in which she responded uh, that the lord did speak to her and she began to speak she began to to say what she heard, what was coming through her from her connection with God. And he yelled, away with her, away with her. She was put in jail. And on June 1st, 1660, she was brought to the gallows to the great elm tree in Boston Common. Though there were some reports that she too was killed on the Boston neck, but most of them say Boston Common. Um, And she was asked one last time if she would comply, if she would save herself and she refused. So she died a martyr. There's a statue in her honor that has been erected in the State House lawn, the Boston or Massachusetts State House, looking out onto the Boston Common. Oh. Wait, okay. Didn't we aren't they putting up a monument of some kind where the tree was in Boston Common? That's what we thought because remember there was all that construction when we were going by because we were right. trying to like see where the plaque was, where the elm tree had yeah. been. They're doing something. I don't there. know because I remember certain. you yeah. were telling me there about was this a... tree. Which is why I thought it was still there, but you're right. Yeah. Yeah. There is a statue now, like an art installation of someone who's like holding themselves and like basically like weeping and crying. And I have no idea if it's like to honor what had happened there or not. I should look that up. But yeah, they were they were putting something up when we were there because we were trying to go see the yeah. spot. So her statue's there looking out onto the commons and people have heard eerie sounds come from this general area and they see a woman in puritan clothing that a lot of people believe could be mary dyer Mm -hmm. in 1894 a writer of the independent wrote an article about the quote white witch of the common so over 100 years ago there were already rumors of haunting this place being haunted 
And the article wrote about an apparition that had first appeared on June 1st, 1750, which was the 90th anniversary of Mary Dyer's death. And apparently there had been a man who was in the park that night in Boston Common, and he was really drunk. He was feeling super low and an apparition walked up to him and she spoke to him and she told him things that he refused to ever repeat ever again. He was like, I, I cannot tell you what she told me, but he completely turned his life around. He sobered up. It changed the entire trajectory of his life. And so a lot of people believe that this was the spirit of Mary Dyer because it would make sense. Her beliefs, her Quakerism, uh, her basically speaking from God and being a bit of like a a prophet, a minister of, of sorts, it would make sense that she went and spoke to him and had this like really deep and touching conversation. So that makes me wonder because you're saying like this is the first time her spirit was really reported or written about, but it makes me wonder how many other people had experienced or been visited by her, but because the information was so personal that they kept it to themselves and never told anyone. Right. Because this was 150 years later that this person is talking about like writing an article on what happened 150 years before to someone with the spirit of someone who died 90 years before that. Right. So yeah, it it's convoluted. It's hard to, with so many of these documents to know, like what was truth, what was rumor, what was for the excitement and entertainment of readers too. Right. But I'm sure there's been a, a ton of people who've experienced her. Many other people have lost their lives to the hanging tree, the great elm in Boston Common. Those accused of theft, murder, or just having different beliefs from others because it was a great place for people to gather to witness these things. It was a warning sign to others. They would let people hang there for days. And so it made it a very perfect place to kill accused witches. Anne Goody Glover is Boston's most famous accused witch. She was a strong-willed Irish woman who worked for a wealthy family in Boston. And this family that she worked for, they had a 13-year-old daughter. (laughs) And if we remember what we were like as teen girls, can you imagine what we would have been like during this era? Probably terrible and similar to what this 13-year-old girl was like, where she got in a fight with Goody, didn't like what Goody was saying. She accused Goody's daughter of stealing laundry from her family. And so Anne Goody Glover was like, I'm not going to let that accusation slide. And she had a really harsh conversation with all of the kids at the family about like lying and accusing people and all this stuff. And so the kids at the family who she worked for were like, okay, we're going to start acting strange. We're going to suddenly fall ill. We're going to do all these things. Our diagnosis, we're bewitched by you, Anne Goody Glover. So my question, because the like, well, there was a lot of witchcraft and accusations in Europe before it made its way to the colonies and and all of that but it's just so fascinating because it was like it's the work of the devil so it originates in like religion and then it just becomes this dramatized like horrific accusation and it was like from what it sounds like children couldn't be children they couldn't have imaginations they couldn't play they couldn't come up with any sort of scenario that is exciting and stimulating to their minds they had to be perfectly Mm -hmm. like still and quiet and anything that they did that was creative and creating these scenarios would be considered them being bewitched and if they are you have to figure out who bewitched them and goody was an outspoken outspoken irish woman who was a very easy target to point fingers at for this family in the interrogation of anne goody glover She was unable to recite the Lord's Prayer in English perfectly. Instead, she did it in a bit of a mix of like broken Latin, Gaelic, some English, because she probably didn't fully know English either. So she, or at least the Lord's Prayer perfectly in English with translation. And so that was viewed as, oh my God, she must be in commune with the devil. There were also some small doll-like figures found in her home that were determined at the time to be hosts to spirits 
and demons. In actuality, these were figurines of Catholic saints, or at least that's what people think that they are now, today. But Goody was found guilty nonetheless. She was brought to Boston jail to await her fate. It is also said that when she was in jail awaiting her fate, that people would hear her speaking to someone in jail. And so people were like, she's arguing with the devil. She's talking to the devil. But could it be that she was calming herself or maybe praying to her God? Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Most likely. Or Most likely. I don't know, the fact that you're alone in a prison. Like I talk to myself at home. Yeah. Sometimes if I go too long without speaking for like a few days, I'll just say something out loud. To see if when your I lived voice alone, I would do that all yeah. the time. Yeah. Yeah. And it would like, always be a little croaky and awkward. Yes. And possessed, you know? <sighs> yes. So Goody, she's brought to the Great Elm in Boston Common on November 16th, 1688. The crowd shouted and mocked her. They taunted her. Goody spoke out to the crowd, and what she said, it differs according to various accounts, but generally she gave the same sort of message, and it was basically that death will not fix anything, the children will never be relieved, they've been afflicted, they will remain afflicted, there are more witches, like you're fucked, basically is what she's saying. And they're like, well, who are the witches? And she's like, I'm not giving up any names. But that makes so much sense because if, an, if I were in her shoes, I feel like I would almost do the same thing where it's like, there's nothing you can do in that moment to stop what is happening to you. You've seen it happen for decades to people before you who had different beliefs who were accused of something. So why not get that one last jab to your accusers? Why not make them fear you even in death? It is interesting because there's also stories we've heard where people who were accused were tortured until they said and like confess that they were a witch i do wonder if there's this you know psychologically if there's this aspect of if someone says to you enough you're a witch you're a witch you're a witch and they're beating you they're hurting you they're torturing you that you do you're like i must Start be. To believe it yeah well there was i can't remember which psych class it was that i took but there was a day where we talked about false confessions and they played the tape of this boy who i think was like 10 years old. And the way that the interrogators, the investigators were speaking to him, they basically made him, they tried to get him to confess to killing his sister, his younger sister who had passed away. And he is completely distraught and believes that he did. Like he, at first, he didn't kill her and he was innocent. But because of the way that they were speaking to him, he was convinced that he did something horrible to his sister, killed her, and just had no memory of it. And so he's super upset trying to, like, come to the realization that he's this horrible monster. And he was convinced of it because of other people's words, despite the truth. There's a lot of evidence of that. There are people who get so confused after hours and hours and hours of being questioned that, yeah, you question your own reality. I question my own reality all the time. I know it's hard enough when you have really realistic dreams to understand what's real. I was just thinking of that. I had waking. Yeah. Yeah. Every day I'm like, was that real? Did I have that conversation? Yeah. And like maybe everything's real and we just enter some other world in our dreams. So it's just like or the different fake. differentiating between oh God. <laughs> <laughs> we would totally be brought to the great elm if we were having this conversation back. I told you back in the day. this episode is really making me contemplate some bigger questions about life so my gosh thank god for Thanks. therapy <laughs> couldn't Sorry. agree more okay so goody is hung from the tree and she dies she was the very last accused witch killed in boston and this was in 1688 three years before the witch hysteria in salem massachusetts Visitors in Boston Common have reported seeing a woman who appears strikingly similar to what Anne Goody Glover was said to look like. She's a woman in Puritan era clothing. She's crying. She's sometimes heard screaming in agony and just heartbreak, I think. So people are like, this seems a lot like Anne Goody Glover. Some people are like, well, could this be Mary Dyer? But maybe personality-wise, they're both pretty headstrong, but it, it might seem like 
Mary Dyer was a bit more prepared for her life to be taken from her. And while Goody's spirit may still be restless here, Boston has established an official Goody Glover Day in her remembrance, which is November 16th. And there's a plaque in her honor that now reads, not far from here on the 16th of November, 1688, goodwife Anne Glover, an elderly Irish widow, was hanged as a witch because she had refused to renounce her Catholic faith. Having been deported from her native Ireland to the Barbados with her husband, who died there because of his own loyalty to the Catholic faith, she came to Boston, where she was living for at least six years before she was unjustly condemned to death. This memorial is erected to commemorate Goody Glover as the first Catholic martyr in Massachusetts. Which is like another thing that's so impressive too. Like she saw what happened to her husband in Barbados when he was killed for yeah. speaking out in his beliefs. And she still, I mean, there's so many examples of it. Like the Holocaust. Yeah. You know, people, people are awful. Okay. Moving on to more awfulness. <laughs> Yay. Anne Hibbins is another woman whose life was taken simply for speaking her mind. She didn't agree with a carpenter that was working in her house, and so she spoke up about it, and then she was hanged from the Great Elm. Just like many others, many women who spoke against what was happening and the rule makers, the men, there was eventually a windstorm that brought the Great Elm down. This happened in 1876. Despite I like to think efforts- it wasn't a windstorm. All of the spirits are just shoving that thing to the ground. Yeah. I walked through the common yesterday, actually, because I, I just kind of wanted to like go look at all the places that I was talking about again. Yeah, with of the course. with the lens of having researched it versus just like generally knowing it as I walk through. And there are so many elm trees. <laughs> it, like really freaked me out just looking around. It's like, man, we talk about the great elm, but how many of these other trees here could have just you know some one offs. Well, okay, here's a more positive look on that. What if, I mean, I'm sure Boston State has, or Boston as a city in Massachusetts has like planted a lot of these elms, but I like to think that now this land, like each elm represents the souls lost to that other elm. Wow. There unfortunately are not enough trees in the common to even account for the number of people who died there okay then i imagine (laughs) to continue with my positivity i imagine (laughs) all of this intricate rooted system of the nature the trees the plants that are existing underneath boston commons are running it's like the bloodstream of these roots are the spirits and the souls. trees don't forget no yeah Mm -mm. they hold the memory yeah it makes me wonder too like Speaking of of trees, I wonder how many trees previously existed there and did the trees themselves where they – because, you know, when there's a tree that's ill and, and diseased, depending on what a tree is going through, other trees might pump nutrients towards it or they might take nutrients away and basically kill the tree to save all the others in the forest and around that. And it makes me wonder if there was just something so wrong – with everything that was happening there from a tree's perspective that the trees themselves like unearthed this great elm to try to stop Ooh, everything. I like that. You know, I was talking to someone recently and they had a plant that was dying. And so they, not without really thinking about it, just moved it and it ended up moving it next to another plant. And this is like, they're not potted, they're potted independently, not sharing the same soil or anything the next day they came out and the plant that had been dying totally alive again and it was just like in my mind it's like oh it needed a friend yeah it is so sweet i actually have found that when i propagate plants if i just have some cuttings just like randomly throughout they immediately die but if i put them next to a pothos they do well specifically a pothos, which if you use the water from your pothos plant, if you have any in water, you can dump just a little bit into plant cuttings and it does help them root quicker. Anyway, plant tips. Oh, interesting. The world is interesting. 
Your little green okay, witch so over there. The, <laughs> yeah, the great elm was knocked down by the wind in 1876. And now there's a plaque that stands basically right in front of where the great elm is. And the plaque, upsettingly so, says nothing about all the executions. No mention of it. What does it say? It's just like. It says, here's where the, God, what was that? There was like some group. I keep wanting to say the Minutemen, but I, I don't think it's that. It was like so, some group of people had like formed. It was like the first place where this one particular Wait, that group feels of rebels... so wrong on like yeah. so many levels. I'll have to, I'll have to go walk because I didn't walk on that side of the common yesterday. I guess I did, but I was. I didn't cut through right next to the plaque, but I should go back and see if there's anything new after they did all the construction in that one section. Yeah. Or do we need to start like a petition? A petition? Probably. Okay. So there's been a lot of death here in this area and at the hands of the tree or the people who executed people on the tree, visitors of the common often report seeing pale apparitions hanging from the trees still in the park so while the great elm is gone people still see bodies swaying from these trees oh surrounding trees people also say that they hear what sounds like a rope creaking against a tree branch Mm. oh that's really really sad so sad there's also a local shop owner nearby i think it was like a tobacco shop that i read and he said that he often hears chains rattling early in the morning. And he was like, I wonder if it could be goody. But I was like, goody? It doesn't really seem like something Anne Goody Glover would do. To me, it sounds more like this could be a, a result of some of the phantom soldiers that haunt Boston Common. You should go knock on or like, I don't know, go stop by that shop. The tobacco shop? Yeah. There's only a few. And I think ask- figure it out ask what time you like they hear it and i don't know camp out and see if you hear anything also here's another great suggestion for me to give people boston okay. common is not safe to be in walking alone at night so good to know don't don't go ghost hunting <laughs> unless you're in a large group because it is is it kind of like central park yeah there's just a concentration of crime right in that general area so there's like the side that we walk on usually to cut through which even at night i wouldn't do that and then there's there's generally like a pretty big police force outside of um the 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 t the train station goes right through there and there's just a lot of activity right on one corner of the common and i've heard of some horrifying things that some of the police people i know who know people who work as police officers in Boston have seen there. So don't walk Mm. through it at night, despite your desire to hear hear the ghosts. Okay. So a century after the witch hangings and all this other stuff, there is the Revolutionary War. Boston Common was used as a camp for over 1,000 British soldiers. So that's where they posted up. And they lived in the common like it it was more than just like them gathering their troops there they like literally posted up and lived there as they were preparing to fight everyone and it was from here from boston common that the british soldiers split up into i think it was three different brigades to leave the common and begin their journey west to lexington and concord to fight in the Revolutionary War, which Paul Revere, if anyone's a history buff, we know Paul Revere did his midnight ride. He took a boat from the North End to Charlestown, grabbed a, a horse, and then rode out to Lexington and Concord to warn people that the Redcoats were coming, the British are coming. Isn't there, I think I recently heard that Paul Revere wasn't alone, that there was another person with him, and no one remembers his name. Oh, probably. I mean, why don't we know the name of the guy that was in the steeple? Like, I can, I see the steeple too. There's, uh, the old North Church is literally in the steeple. Like, there was the guy who was the lookout who was like, I'll do one 
lantern if they're coming if the british are coming by sea one if they're coming one if by no sorry one if by land two if by sea and that influenced how paul revere got himself over to charlestown and to to save everyone <laughs> yeah there's a lot of other people involved i just googled it okay it says Four men and one woman made late night rides, alerting the early Americans of what dangers lay ahead. Paul Revere, Samuel Prescott, Israel Bissell, William Dawes, and Sybil Luddington. And this one sentence is funny. It says, while Paul Revere rode into history on April 18, 1775, his fellow rider, William Dawes, galloped into undeserved oblivion. Oh, my God. It is also, if anyone's coming to Boston, you can go see one of the lanterns that was hung in the North End. It's in the church that you can go into. And the other one is in Concord, Massachusetts. I've seen both. Okay, so the British, it's this big thing in history now that we know that they came from that area and they were posted up there and it's this whole thing, the Revolutionary War. But there were plenty of British, British soldiers that also died in the common because amongst themselves, they had rules and laws and when people committed crimes fellow british people soldiers they would try them their fellow british men and kill them like use the gallows that were in the common many people have seen the spirits of these soldiers because they see spirits in this period appropriate like period clothing red coats soldiers uniforms and there's one particular spot along the common that you may not expect to see a spirit of a soldier, uh, but people do. And it is in the subway station. It is on the T. I thought you were going to say on the carousel. Oh, oh, I wish. <laughs> the carousel. Oh, man. The carousel is actually very close to where there was the, how are we describing it? All the like gross sludge, the meat stew, the moist the stew. Moist, the stew. Yeah, moist stew. Moist stew. Yeah, the carousel is like right, right there. <laughs> so, no, but when people, it's it's early morning. So only when people are riding the train early morning, they will see sometimes a British soldier dressed in his complete red coat ensemble holding a musket and standing on the tracks. On the tracks. Yeah. That must be really unsettling to observe. Yeah. And also very i'm curious about the spirit is it residual is this spirit momentarily like blips it gl glitching flipping into our timeline and what do they think i mean how confused are they questions that will never have an answer it is confusing because also i mean i know a lot of boston's been filled in with landfill but boston common existed and it's not it's not mm. like, like this man is appearing 30 feet below earth. So it's not like he was always there unless his, unless he was buried there and he's just appearing where he was buried in like a mass grave, you know? After the Revolutionary War, there was another notable execution in Boston Common. And it is the execution of a female pirate, Rachel Schmidt was born in 1760s Pennsylvania and she left home at age 16 because she loved the ocean and she just really wanted to live by the water. And so at age 16, she married fisherman George Wall. I have no idea how old George was. The two eventually moved to Boston together. I love Rachel already. You can have Andrew Ranson. I want Rachel. Okay, well, I'll see how you feel at the end of this because I'm kind of back and forth on her because it's one of those things where like, if it's true what she did, you you begin to hate her. But then you're also like, well, these history books and, and all of these people who are accused and executed, half of them didn't do what they said they did. And there's a lot of sexism and she's a woman. Yeah. So. Okay. Excited to learn her. More. And George, they move. I think they spent some time maybe in like New York City or something like that. And then they eventually moved to Boston together. Rachel is working as a maid in Beacon Hill. She seemed quite pleased with her life because she was working on the hill, surrounded by the sea. Life is good. There's marshes. It's beautiful. She smells the ocean air. And they have a really good group of friends. Like, she has a thriving social life there. But George wants more for their lives. He's like, yeah, it's fun. It's comfortable. It's beautiful. But where's the thrill? 
So at his, at his encouragement, George, Rachel, and a group of their male friends, or maybe George's male friends, they together become pirates. They came up with a plan to steal a ship. The Essex was the ship that they stole. It operated near the Isle of Shoals in New Hampshire, which you covered in an episode of years ago, the Isle of Shoals. Very haunted place. Lots of crime. Um, and the Essex, they stole the ship. It is the vessel that they used to then basically bait other ships in to pirate and steal and murder. So they waited for when they first got this boat, the Essex, they waited for a day when the water, when there was a storm rolling in. So like the water was churning, the sky was dark and gray. You could barely tell the difference between what was sky, what was ocean. And they dressed up the Essex, the stolen ship, like it had been damaged during the storm. And Rachel was the bait. So she would cry. She waved her hands in distress as there was this passing ship coming by. And the ship comes up and they're like, oh my gosh, like her boat looks destroyed. They're like, where's your husband? <laughs> First question. And she's like, I don't know. He left me. He abandoned me. I'm, I'm out here. She's in total distress. They dock up beside her. They get off to help her. And all of the men, her husband included, rush her saviors and they kill those people. They used this strategy 12 times, killing at least 24 people in two years. Okay, here's my question. What is the purpose of killing said people? The thrill of killing. Was it truly just that or like were there was there a booty to be gotten? They could have gotten the booty regardless because most of these ships, it would be like two people on a boat and then a big group of them. They could have rushed them and stole their stuff and left these people alive, but they didn't. How they many of them, them were on their pirate ship? I don't, I have no idea. Um, okay, but it wasn't just but it said the two a, It was a group. It was a larger group. Okay. So it was like, I, I would guess maybe like six versus two. I don't know what the motive was to kill these people because they... It seemed like in almost every instance, they didn't need to. I mean, they never needed to, but. No one ever needs to. Yeah, yeah. Unless it's like someone attacking you and you're protecting yourself. Self-defense, yes. Karma eventually caught up to George. He drowned in a shipwreck. Rachel was with him, but miraculously, she was saved. She returned to Boston and she went back to working as a maid. But the thrill of crime, you know, she got a little taste of it and she was like, this life is too mundane for me. I can't just work as a maid. So she continued to be a pirate on her own. She became notorious for stealing docked ships in, Bo in the Boston Harbor. Uh, she was caught many times and she was convicted of petty theft and larceny. And I don't believe she ever murdered anyone on her own. Um, I think it was probably just the male group of pirates she was with who did it before. Uh, but she was always released. Every time she was caught, she was released. But she never really felt dissuaded from continuing with the crimes because she was always released. And so she began to expand. She was now a pirate and a highway robber. On March 18th, 1789, Rachel Wall approached 17-year-old Margaret Bender on the public highway in Boston, Massachusetts. Margaret was alone, perfect target, and Rachel approached her tore her bonnet off of her head, placed Rachel put, placed Margaret's bonnet on her own head, and then took Margaret's shoes and buckles and ran. It was also What a said, detail. And, the bonnet is like such a specific, strange choice. Yeah. It's also just like she didn't need to steal any of those. She didn't need to do that. It was like a taunting thing, you know? Yeah. Huh. Big bully move. Yeah. It was also said, and I don't know if this is true, but it's said that Rachel stuck her hand into Margaret's mouth and attempted to yank Margaret's tongue out. Hmm. So, Rachel. Not sure how I feel about Rachel. <laughs> What's going on? Yeah. Uh, she's caught for doing this. <laughs> she's sent to jail. And on August 25th of that year, she's found guilty. She admits to her crimes as a pirate, but she denies the murders and highway robbery. So this is one of those things where I was like, I don't know. Like, can we believe her? Do we know? Like, there's no way to know. Yeah. There's no way to know. It's with everyone who was 
tried at that time. Like we have no idea whether they were male, female, child, adult. We don't know if what they said to have done is what they did. It is interesting that after she, you know, started her own branch of pirating, that there was murder was not a part of it. That does make me wonder if the murder was perhaps more of the men, her husbands, and the other pirates' forte and their choice, and hers was more of the getting what she wanted, which was like, I don't know, people's things. Also, what did she do with the ships that she would steal from the harbor? What would she do with them? I don't know. I don't know. I think maybe just take them for a joyride to say that she could. She probably docked them back up again just somewhere else. I bet she had the best stories. Oh, I'm sure. It's also hard because, like, let's remember she was married to this man at 16 years old. Like, how much was shaped in her life and of how she behaved as an adult from this marriage and what she was exposed to and what they did when she was young? Governor John Hancock. He signed the order to execute Rachel Wall by hanging. And at the time, the Great Elm was still up. It's not the 1800s. Of course he signed it. The classic guy in his signature, John Hancock, thousands of people came to watch Rachel. Uh, She spoke to them. She said she was innocent. She forgives all of those who accused her. But she basically was telling people, she was like, If there's one warning I can give you, it's that women, girls especially, you guys got to be careful because you too, despite your innocence and despite how you feel you live your life, you could be tried and hanged just like me. I too am innocent. This could be you tomorrow. Rachel Wall was 29 years old. She was the last woman hanged in Massachusetts, and she's New England's only female pirate. Wow. Her spirit has been linked to various paranormal activity in the common though i i really don't know how people can tell who's who either i mean that's the biggest thing about bandana running around yeah Yeah. maybe she's wearing the the bonnet that she stole the bonnet and the buckles she's got buckles on her hand she's running i don't know (laughs) many people have seen two women dressed in victorian era clothing arm in arm taking a stroll through the park and occasionally sitting to rest and chat with one another on the benches so i'd love to know who those women are I was going to say, that doesn't sound like Rachel at all. It no, <laughs> doesn't sound no, like Rachel's vibe. Well, okay, it does make good. me wonder too, like, are these women who their spirits, they knew each other and just like had such a good friendship that this is almost like a residual stain that they left on the park? Was there some sort of trauma that happened to them during this time period that they are like actively haunting there? Or are they two completely separate spirits that became friends in the afterlife? Oh, I love that. Or are they just you and I, you know, types of people who Our past lives. just are, or I mean more like just like buddies oh, who are like, buddies. let's stay you know? ghosts. This is fun. Let's just walk around cool. and people watch. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it seems like they love people watching, but if you look at them, it's said that they disappear pretty quick. So you're not really supposed to acknowledge mm-hmm. them. Hard to yeah, don't make eye do contact. That. There's a cemetery right next to the park as well. It's the Central Burying Ground. Uh, Notable artists have been buried there, some of America's earliest poets, participants of the Boston Tea Party, and more. And then just steps away from that is the Granary Burying Ground, where Paul Revere is buried. The common has obviously seen some things, deaths, hardships, riots, rallies, crime, war, celebrities, and so much more. But to name a few of the non-ghostly and more notable facts about the common... Uh, fireworks displays began in the common in 1745, which is so much earlier than I would have guessed if I was hearing that at, at trivia. The last known execution in the common was in 1817, which means the Boston common was used as a gallows for almost two centuries. 1817. Wait, okay. So when was when did Rachel get hanged? She was the like mid to late uh, 1700s. Okay. So she was the last woman. She was the last woman. Yeah. Okay. 1789 is when she was Okay, so for 30 executed. more years, people were being... 30 more years. Mm-hmm. Executed, okay. Black people and Native Americans were not allowed in the park in Boston Common until July 4th, 1836. There were famous and historical figures that gathered here, like George Washington, John Adams, General Lafayette. 
MLK led a civil rights rally here in the common. And since 1987, Nova Scotia and Canada has donated the annual Christmas tree to Boston as a thank you for Boston's Red Cross and Massachusetts Public Safety Committee's efforts following the Halifax explosion of 1917. So still to this day, over 100 years? To this day. Yes, we still get a tree, a Christmas tree from them. The Boston Common was declared a National Historic Landmark in 1987. And Boston also installed the first subway in the United States, which bordered the common. And I have just a few more facts for you guys. You seem excited about these ones. That is a little bit ghostly. Oh, okay, good. (laughs) Can I real quick tell a story? And this is um, related to the Boston Commons. So we have managers, David and Zach, and you and I were together and they don't really represent podcast necessarily i think we might be their only podcast they also would never naturally listen to our podcast they're not no. normal enthusiasts <laughs> no and I, I don't know that they believe i mean maybe they do we haven't clarified but anyway i think they every find time us incredibly we- wacky and scary <laughs> yes and they're they try to be very nice when we talk about things that we're doing but they're always like okay <laughs> It's like that grandmother who tries to be supportive but does not get you at all. Um, And they'll call us and be like, are you okay? Knowing some of the things we do, places we go to. They're like, just checking in, making sure you're not possessed. We were together and we're walking around in Boston when they called. And we were like, we're actually at Paul Revere's gravestone right now. And they kind of gave this like laugh of, I don't know how to respond to you. It was more but than that. But of course, we that's had what a, you're doing. We had a business meeting with them, with someone else. And they called us like six minutes after that meeting ended to debrief. And we were already yeah. at Paul Revere's gravestone. So they were like, oh, yeah. what the hell? <laughs> yeah, we were we like, got, we, we couldn't get off that the call computer sooner. Shut. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ran to the cemetery. <laughs> yes. We're spooky gals um, and I love it. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So Boston started working on pioneering America's first subway system back in 1895. So this was a very exciting thing to happen. But what they had not expected was to unearth more than 1,000 dead bodies beneath the common. Many British soldiers buried from the Revolutionary War, but many others were dismembered in unmarked graves, just a few feet below the earth, thought to be people who were executed, people who were poor, people who were ill and had died from diseases. Okay, dismembered, though, is different than just yeah. dead. I know. Okay. It's pretty gross. We just need Could have been to from the war. Draw attention. Could have been from the war. Okay. Yeah. Okay. A Boston Post article from the Times said, quote, The work on the commons is proceeding cautiously as new tombs are met at every step. Yesterday was gathered up a great box of bones. Among the heap were seven skulls. One of them covered in long brown hair. Covered in? Yeah, what? someone still had their hair. Okay, I was picturing like coming out of like all parts of their body. Oh, like no, no, no. Their skull. Their skull. Okay, okay, okay. But I mean, let's think about that. There's a box of skulls <laughs> that they unearthed. Like there's just body parts. With, like every, It's all mashed together. People were just being thrown, I guess underground all of the bodies that were discovered during this dig were moved to the central burying ground cemetery i think some of them were i mean it was so long after so many people had died that i don't think there was a way to identify most of them and any that were identified if there were living relatives i think that's a very rare thing but maybe a few people were moved elsewhere but the majority of them were brought to the central burying ground cemetery which is in the corner of the common a cemetery within the common those over a thousand people, their bones were just dumped right back in one hole together with a single headstone marking the spot. It's difficult, right? Because there's no way to identify these people and you want to give them some type of recognition, but how do you do that? And especially if they're digging up this many, they're probably just trying to do the best they can totally with reburying right. them. I don't what know. more could they do? Like there's no, and it's also like a resource thing too. Like how do, how do you identify people? And it, it seems like a very impossible task, but 
I think some people might have been, but the majority were all put together in one grave. And in that one grave, they were then uh, recognized with a single tombstone. Just as the executions had drawn a crowd to the common, the promise of seeing a dead body being unearthed during this dig did the same, and people flocked to the common to watch the construction project. I do think that's better than watching people actually be executed. Yes, I agree, because I will admit, I would never go watch an execution that is incredibly disturbing to me. I would definitely post up in front of a construction site (laughs) if I knew bones from people who lived hundreds of years before me were being unearthed. I think if it was something where it's like, this could be someone from 20 years ago, that would equally disturb me. But for some reason, the amount of time between me and those people, in my mind, I'm like, yeah, it's my morbid curiosity. I feel like I would be intrigued enough to potentially It is a bit like archaeology and the digs that occur all over the world. A lot of them, they do end up finding remains and they're very you know i don't know how they did it here but they're very very careful with how they remove them and try to you know retain how they are and find all these incredible old artifacts you're right we put we slap the label of archaeology on it and then it sounds it's professional just, <laughs> it's legit our morbid curiosity is now a profession yeah <laughs> um it's said at this time unfortunately People began body snatching. People were stealing the bones of these poor people and auctioning them off, which does make me wonder because you know how there was all that drama with like Harvard and various other medical schools that had actual body snatchers and like were grave robbing to get bodies to – I mean, skeletons are expensive. I wonder how many might have ended up just like on display – at one of the universities nearby. So I'm like, who's buying these? Well, I guess maybe. It, they are, a lot of these people are, yeah, very historically significant. So maybe a lot of buyers. In response to all of the interest and concern, and now crime, associated with these unearthings, the city placed a large canvas around the construction project to try to shield people from seeing it. But many people, I guess the ones that were less excited about the discovery of these bodies, they raised concerns about a few things. They were like, okay, surely digging up thousands of dead, rotting bodies would pose some sort of health threat, right? Half of them are decaying basically out in the open for short periods of time, like during the construction project. Um, And many of them were people who had died from illnesses and sicknesses. So there was a lot of concern for people's health the air quality, the plants in the park, because some trees started to die as well. So it was kind of a, I don't know what was going on, but people were like, okay, you can be dazzled and fascinated and disgusted by what's going on. But let's also remember like we we could also be, <laughs> the living could be in danger here as well. So the train station was built. Uh, the T, the train that goes alongside the park, I think it's a, one of the stops still exists from that original dig. And now it's a little, the path is a little bit different, but it still offers hauntings of its own. So in addition to that red coat soldier that is seen in the early morning, people hear moaning and wailing emanate from deep within the train tunnels. And the fact that it's a tunnel makes it probably even spookier Mm -hmm. and echo and travel in strange ways. Yeah. Three years after the train system was installed, there was a gas explosion, which killed six people. And in more recent times, and I find this super disturbing, The biography channels show haunted encounters face-to-face tried to get a reaction from the spirits by playing sounds of people screaming and the sounds of explosions. But all their equipment was shut off immediately. So the ghosts were like, F you, you're out of here. That reminds me, okay, this this is my comparison, is when there was a kitten once stuck underneath a, or hiding underneath a car and I was trying, like I was literally like crawling under trying to get it. I was like, what if I play the sound of like a mama cat meowing that and it didn't work no but you were doing you were what you were doing (laughs) i feel like (laughs) that's what i mean you can't even compare that that. (laughs) yeah there's no comparison something to (laughs) elicit a reaction from something in front of you but yours was to save a bird yeah to repeat the trauma that these 
people yeah, had theft. experienced to potentially see a ghost for their own entertainment or to make profit yes. for their own yeah television mm -hmm. in the 1970s a man named dr rucker which i wrote or i read that he was a retired dentist he was walking by the cemetery in the boston common and was startled when he saw a young girl who appeared to be dressed in a very dirty oversized white dress her face appeared to be covered with some sort of like ash or dirt she was staring at him and she was standing completely still unblinking and so he was like oh this is kind of creepy he looks away and when he does the girl appears again in his eye line in a different spot and this continues to happen so every time he changes the direction of his eyes she appears again in the distance right in front of him and so he's freaked out he's moving quickly through the common he's going down the sidewalks and everywhere she is there he's trying to make it to his car he then grabs his keys from his pocket as he's nearing his car and he suddenly feels a cold chill <gasps> wash over him she's there her little hand reaches out and oh. throws his keys to the ground He's able to pick up his keys and get to his car, and she's not there anymore, but it does make us wonder, why was she trying so hard to get his attention, and why was she trying to make him stay? My nipples. My God. <laughs> <sighs> Spooky. That is... I'm just curious, like, yeah, did she try to save him? Like... Did she not want to get him? Did she not want him to get in the car? Was she trying to just like Rachel? Was she just being a bit menacing? Those are I all great yeah. questions because it's all it all leads back to us not understanding the other side and what different spirits can go through and what they have access to because it's like, yeah, was she was she a demon? Was she just a child who was confused and was like looking for help? Was she frustrated? or did she have some sort of insight into what would happen to him if he got into his car at that particular time that he would have if he hadn't ran to his car because she was freaking him out like so many questions especially because we often hear you know a spirit appearing in your periphery and then disappearing and that's kind of all you see but for this spirit to continue to show up in front of him vision wise and then all the way to his car and intentionally grab his keys and throw them like that feels very very purposeful but yet mysterious and in the few reports that i was reading that told this story it didn't make it sound like she was ever walking it made it sound like she was just always poof, just poof 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 standing and staring and unblinking and so i feel like it would be even more terrifying the fact that you just keep seeing this little girl who's completely frozen still like a statue and then suddenly she reaches out and slaps the keys out of your hand i wish i could do that like that would be <laughs> such a cool superpower just to like blip uh, wherever you wanted the blip yeah she's the flash yeah so to wrap this up today millions of people visit the common each year people who wander around the cemetery say they feel a heaviness in the air a general feeling of being watched the feeling of being in a crowded space despite being completely alone, the feeling of deep sorrow overcoming them. Men in military uniforms can be spotted walking through the grass and disappearing moments later. Strange noises, glowing orbs, and darting shadows startle both locals and tourists who venture through this well-traveled park. And many suspect that there are thousands of more bodies below, hidden just below our feet until the next big dig. And there's more to this area than what we've just uncovered. For the citizens of the 1960s, there was a new threat looming over the city. A strangler was on the loose. Part two. You've got a great knack for hang oh, for cliffhangers. <laughs> cliffhangers. For the Boston cliffhangers. Strangler. Is there much mob stuff in the Boston Commons? I did that, look that up and I didn't really see anything, which surprised me. I think a lot of it was mostly concentrated in Charlestown and Southie. Mm. But oh, also I imagine that it happened like in the secrecy of buildings and undergrounds. They're not like operating in the park. No, no, no. Yeah, right out in the open in the park. No. Yeah. They might be like I doing that some, same thought. you know, clandestine meetings, but they're not doing the mm – -hmm. 
the murdering and stuff. Throwing someone into the car and heading towards the Charles River. Do a little dumping yeah. in uh, Upper Mystic Lake. This is incredible. Corinne, I'm – one, you're such an incredible storyteller. Um, oh, thank you and for the two, compliments today, Sabrina. <laughs> two, um, this is all me making up for for saying a mean thing about your hand-modeling career. Oh, on night. Campfire Stories, people were taken <laughs> aback by that. I wasn't. <laughs> I knew what you meant. <laughs> I I didn't mean it in a mean you way. Me, you meant like, like the way I made my hand come yeah. into the frame. Because someone was like, yeah. oh, let's see your nails. And then I like put my hand up just like like in a weird way. And you were like, yeah. I love you, Corinne, but you do not have a career in hand modeling. And people were like, oh. <gasps> yeah. But you and also like. Not <laughs> the beauty of my hands. But just no, like it had nothing the, to do. The weird the pose I had. Yeah. I was like, yeah. I was like here you go. <laughs> it was just weird. It was like the moist stew of hand modeling that like when you yeah. came in, I'm making it worse. Okay, I'm done. It, I can't even recreate only. how bad it was, but whatever I did with my hand was super ugly. But yeah. I think I was like, oh, yeah. thanks. And so <laughs> I think thought it was <laughs> mean. It wasn't. It was. It wasn't. It was about my it wasn't. my posing skills, which I don't have. Yeah. Any, so. Anyway, so I I was complimenting you, but then also this is so fascinating, and I love that it's a two parter. You're doing such a good job, and I can't wait for part two. Oh, thank you. I'm excited for part two. I haven't even written it yet. <laughs> That's fine. It's gonna That's be great. great. It will be. I believe it. Um, I'm enthralled. I'm hooked. If Thanks. you may. I found a shorter story, um, not specifically about Boston Commons, but it is about Boston and it is a, the subject line really just hooked, you know, speaking of being hooked, it's from our listener, Danielle, and it's called Solving Crimes from the Other Side. Hey girls and ghost, I started your podcast in 2020 and I was a skeptic, but now that I have binged all of your episodes. I am a firm believer. Yes. That is the highest praise. That makes me feel so good. It's the best. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Danielle. Welcome to the dark side. <laughs> uh, Danielle said, witch, you're a witch. <laughs> We're all witches here. Yes. Whether, you know, you know, it's a compliment now. I have never had a personal experience with the paranormal other than a shadow person used to watch me sleep but my family has. After listening to the last encounters, when you asked for first responder stories, I knew I had to email in. This story takes place right after my great-grandfather passed away in the mid-1950s. He passed suddenly and worked as a detective in Boston. His death came as a shock to his wife, my great-grandmother, and his three kids, my two great-uncles, and my nana. When they learned of his passing, my great-grandma was overwhelmed with grief. Caring friends convinced her to go lay down and rest, and they would take care of the kids. She went into their room to close her eyes, but she kept seeing my great-grandfather's face. She got up and told everyone that she can't sleep because all she could see was him when she closed her eyes. Everyone told her, you need to rest, and it was just the grief and shock. Again, she tried, but when she closed her eyes, again, she saw him. And he was saying something, but she couldn't hear. So she went out again to tell her friends what was happening. And one of them said, okay, we'll go back to bed and see what he has to say. So again, she goes back to bed and one more time and one more time closes her eyes. She focused on him and tried to listen to what he was saying. Then she saw him and heard him say, my shirts, check my shirts, my shirts, check my shirts over and over. Annoyed, she got up once more and told everyone about what he said, and everyone was a bit confused and unsure why she was seeing and hearing this when she kept trying to sleep. Then she put the pieces together. Before he died, he was working on a big case on a gang in Boston. This was before computers, so all of the files were on paper. She was convinced it had something to do with that, but was still too overcome with grief to actually look. So she sent both of my great uncles to search. They searched the closet, tore apart the dresser drawers, checked all of his coat pockets, and nothing. Then they looked one more time in the dresser, and they found 
a case file taped underneath his shirt drawer. They immediately brought it to the station, and with the evidence oh he God. found, they arrested the top gang members. No way. <laughs> that is incredible. Yes. Go solving crimes from beyond the grave. Danielle said, thank you for all you do and turning the skeptic into a believer. See you on the other side, Danielle. Oh, I can just only imagine how excited he probably felt realizing that he he might have a huge piece of the like missing puzzle, like a missing puzzle piece to help crack the case. And I'm sure he was probably waiting for like a few more things to line up to present all of this. And then when he passed, clearly his spirit was like, oh my God, I never got the opportunity to give them what I found. I have to tell someone. I have to have this figured out. Yes. And there's so much to this that we could dive into. But the fact that he, you know, I mean, it's so tragic that he died so suddenly and there was no real peace for the family. And it must be so tragic to have experienced. But for her, for him to show up, and be so focused on the case. <laughs> yeah. Is, right. Is I think it's probably not like, telling hey, about how are you? Like, the case. Yeah. <laughs> the case. My shirts, quick. I only yeah. have 30 seconds here. <laughs> but then at the same time, because of the verification like that it did solve the case and his message was, you know, founded in truth and they found this, it must have given them some peace to be like, oh. He's okay. He's on the other side. Yeah. yeah. He got to prove multiple things with At just once. one visit. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. I love that. That's <laughs> Me an too. amazing and incredible use of spirit power to come back and give the message and for that message to not feel like gibberish, right? Like they, right. She believed. It's so and clear. She went and she searched and yeah. she found exactly what he was saying. Right. Yeah. So wow. clear. Wow. And I'm glad all the friends were like, just listen to him then. Yeah. Yeah. So supportive. Yeah. So nice. Ugh. Well, I'm so excited for part two, Corinne. Boston, baby. Boston. Okay. Everyone, we'll see you next week when Corinne, again, graces our ears with her beautiful voice and her wonderful research. And until then, we'll see you for Encounters and campfire stories every tuesday on patreon what else um youtube you can watch us do our thing mm -hmm. you can see some photos that corinne has referenced in the story we've merch social media yeah the good stuff you know i got a lot of yes. good things cooking too so i yeah. would advise that everyone just follows us on everything because yes i think in my eyes, you'll be rewarded. Follow us into the dark. It'll be great. It's a good time over here. It's just going to be a depressing two weeks with my Boston stories, but we'll come out of it and it will be but lovely. You know what? It's depressing, but extremely informative and interesting. Mm -hmm. And while dark, we're telling stories of people who perhaps were wronged and while they don't have actual justice maybe we can do their stories justice yeah and these are some of the stories you're not going to hear on your freedom trail tour so mm -mm. you have yes. us to tell you <laughs> we the are your guys histories yes thank you for joining us thank you to our editor christina for editing we're so grateful for all of you and we will see you, see you on the, the other, other side, side. Very smooth.